I put on there to be able to look after others, you first need to look after yourselves. And I think it's something that we've all heard that statement in life before, um, but we often forget it. Um, before, obviously, oh, um, COVID-19 hit, when, when we all used to, um, a lot of us would maybe go on our easy jet flights or jet two or whatever it was on holiday somewhere. When you got the safety briefing, whether you were traveling with your 90 year old granny or whether it was your five year old niece or nephew, um, you know, whose safety belt did they tell you, not safety belt, whose oxygen mask did they tell you to fit first um, if they were activated? It was always your own because to be able to help, you know, to help the people you were traveling with, you had to put your oxygen mask on first. And I think in life, both inside work and outside work, a lot of us forget that on a definitely weekly basis, if not sometimes a daily basis that way. So um, what does this all mean then? How, how can we sort of take this forward? Well, um, I've got a couple of questions um, for you. And I really sort of would like you to have a little think about how easily you could answer these two questions. So the first question I'm going to put up here is, tell us about one of your strengths, right? So uh, we're going to do um, a little poll right, round about this, right? Um, and um, as Roxy and, um, said at the very beginning, this poll's anonymous, so don't worry about it. We won't be able to uh, uh, you know, say this is you or whatever, but um, we're just going to do a little poll. And I just want you to answer how comfortable you are about talking about your strengths. So I'm going to stop this share here and um, we'll launch the poll. Are we getting some of responses in, Rebecca? Yep, so we've got uh, 15 out of 23 just now. I'll see if they go up, and if not, I'll just share it now. Yep, I'll just share it at that, so. Thank you. So that, that, that's really good because um, the, the numbers coming in there, hopefully you can, you can see that. Um, I'm saying about 50% of us are, are okay. Um, another sort of coming up to 40 percent appreciate that you have good qualities and you're happy to, to talk about them and take it forward um, and obviously there's a few people that would be uncomfortable um, doing that or um, a, you know maybe maybe not totally aware about what your strengths are if i was to do this in a workshop with yourselves i would suggest that more of you would go to the uncomfortable stage right um, simply because when you actually have to speak out loud about your strengths, often it makes us feel uncomfortable that way. And uh, the key thing we've got to remember is that every strength is a weakness and every weakness is a strength. What do I mean by that? Well, self-confidence is a strength. When it becomes arrogance, it becomes a weakness. Likewise, you can turn around and say that um, self-doubt um, is, is, a, is a weakness. But the ability to reflect and learn is a strength. So it's all about degrees when we come there. Okay, Rebecca, I'm going to go back onto the slides now, okay? So that's the first question. And then the second question, um, and it's probably very valid in the world we're living in in the last month, is, is this one, round about, you know, What's the best news you've heard in the past week, right? Um, uh, you know, how comfortable would you be finding some good news to actually share and do? And one of the things to think a little bit about is if I was to ask you about the best news you've heard in the past week, in most cases, right, it probably would not be coming from this. Now, that's the BBC News um, website, obviously. I mean, you can get news from Sky, you can get it online, Facebook, whatever. 
But one of the things I always think you need to remember in about the news, it's, it's there to get our attention. So the vast majority of what we hear on the news is actually just to get our attention. So it tends to be either very good or very bad. And there's actually often, um, it it's, tends to be more towards the bad side. So if you're felt feeling a bit um, vulnerable, if you ever feeling at the stage that you're not firing on all cylinders, the worst thing you can do is look at the news. I've been speaking to people this week, right, who are continually looking at the news on their phones. And I've been saying to them, look twice a day at the most. You know, look at maybe first thing in the morning, at some stage in the morning, right? Have a look maybe in the early evening, but ration yourself to it because it's just the same news over and over. And all it's done is reinforcing sometimes quite quite a negative picture. And there is some good news, you know, obviously the things like the eight o'clock clap and bagpipes and that type of stuff with the NHS last night and these sort of things are, are good, but the vast majority is not helping our own personal resilience because it's making us more vulnerable to, to other things, to worry and to, to self-doubt that way. So we actually all have a circle of concern in life. What do we mean by this? Well, we have a circle of concern. That circle of concern could be what's going on this now with COVID-19. It could be things like global warming. It could be things like plastic in the ocean. It could be um, that your son or daughter is not getting to set their exams. It could be the fact that you've got an elderly parent or you might have somebody that actually is in hospital this now. Anything like that, we all have a pile of concerns in, in our lives. And the bad news for the 99.9% .9 of us um, that live on the planet, right, is our circle of concern is actually bigger than our circle of influence, what we can actually influence in life, right? And um, even sort of worse news than that is what we can influence in life, right, is obviously less than the concern, but what we actually control in life is less than what we can influence. And if I was to ask you, what do you truly control in life? In reality, the answer to that question, right, is that the only thing we truly control is ourselves, our reactions to situations, what our choices we make and what we do, right? We actually don't really control anything else. Those of us that have had children will realize we can influence them, but the one thing you can't do is control them. If your four-year-old wants to have a tantrum in Tesco's aisle, your four-year-old is going to have a tantrum, and that's the way it's going to be. Um, so one of the things to think a little bit about is how you can therefore grow your circle of influence, because that is what we're, we're, we're here to try and think a little bit about. How can you grow your circle of influence a bit bigger and take things forward? So an example would be, I have a 17-year-old. She passed a driving test. Um, in early November last year, right? Um, after she passed the driving test, if any parent, if any of you are, are like me that has had children that pass your driving test, you'll know that within about two or three seconds, you go through two mixed emotions. One of you, you go, yes, fantastic, they've passed. And then the next minute you go, oh my God, they're out there. They're going to be on the roads themselves. So, you can imagine what the conversation was like that night when my 17 year old asked for the car, right? Um, she, she was given the car and uh, let's just say that a, a member in the household who remained nameless gave her a lecture about actually not speeding, not having too many people in the car, all that type of stuff, right? What, what was happening here? My wife was trying to control my, my daughter's driving. Right. The trouble was she couldn't control it. She can influence it. And then as we went through November, the same conversation happened most evenings as my 17 year old kept borrowing the car to go out to go to McDonald's and everything else that 17 year olds do these days to, to meet with friends and everything else. But because my wife was having the same conversation week, evening, every single evening, she was 
actually shrinking her circle of influence. You can imagine um, it was going in one ear and out the other, right? It just wasn't having the impact you would have wanted it to have. And what my wife had to realise is the only way of actually growing her circle of influence out the way was that she needed to change her approach. She needed to change what she actually controlled and what she was actually doing and, and doing it. So she had to stop maybe making lectures and maybe ask questions, right? Maybe turn around and say things like, you know, um, just remember what it would be like if something happened and you had to phone somebody's mum or whatever. Turn it into a question rather than making a statement. And what I would suggest to you is that about, I think, about 75% of a lot of our stress in life is actually caused when we try and control things we cannot control. Some of you might have heard a, a rather famous little prayer um, and it starts and it goes like this. God, grant me the serendipity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And I think that's the last bit that always gets me, is the wisdom to know the difference between what you truly do control and what you don't. So what we're going to do is, in a minute, I'm going to um, show you a picture. And when I show you this picture, I want you to memorize the first thing that comes into your mind. And then um, Rebecca, I think, is going to launch a poll for us. And I'm going to get you to tell me what you actually saw that way. So here's the picture. Um, I'll show it for about five, ten seconds. And then we'll launch the poll. Okay, Rebecca, if you would like to launch that poll. Can anybody see the poll coming up? Rebecca, are you okay? Yep, yeah, I'll try relaunching it again because I don't think it's come up. No. no. There we go. There we go. Thank you. There we go. Right, I'll end the poll and share the results just now. Ah. Uh -huh. That doesn't surprise me. So about 95% saw the young lady first. 5% um, saw the elephant, which is um, unusual, right? Um, and nobody saw the young man, um, uh, the young man, the old man there. Okay, um, Rebecca, if you could take down that poll, I'll go back to um, sharing the slide. So um, hopefully some of you can obviously see the, the young lady on the left-hand side, the old man is on the right-hand side, and the elephant is a lot more difficult to see. It's just the head picture of the elephant and um, almost the cheek um, of the, the young lady is the ear and that type of stuff. Um, what I would generally say is from experience, about 90% see the young lady first. About one in 10, see the old man first, right? And about one in a hundred see the elephant. So as a group, you're not that representative because actually nobody actually saw um, the old man first. And, and normally with a, a group of this size, I would expect that to come through. However, the key thing round about this, right? Is the key message is, is we don't see things as they are. We see things as we are. What do I mean by that? We see things depending about what's going on in our life at the time, right? That influences very much our view of the world. So this now, with everything that's happening in the world just now, how you view this could be depending on how it's impacting you with this sort of COVID-19 type stuff. 
Very some people I know have never been busier from a work point of view, right? They're working to nine, ten o'clock at night, um, and their their work has gone absolutely mad. My, my next door neighbour is sitting at home. He runs a chain of five shops, five gift shops. He has nothing to do this now, right? And all his businesses are shut. It changes again depending on what your health is like, your age, and everything else, and what the impacts are is that we don't all see things the same way. We see things as we are, rather than actually how they are that way. And that's why sometimes, right, if you, you know, jump on a train and you're going to an important meeting, and then Scott, Scott Rail, apologies for anybody that works for Scott Rail, but if Scott Rail then run the train 10 minutes late and it's an important meeting or a job interview, you'll see that completely different if you were going into Edinburgh to, on a Saturday afternoon to meet one of your friends um, for a coffee or some lunch or whatever or a beer, you would see it differently whether, whether the train was going to be late or not. It depends what's going on in our lives. It depends how we do it. And sometimes we've just got to remember when we look at the world, we see it through our lens rather than the, the reality of the other lens. So the next thing I'd like to do is introduce you to a little friend of yours, right? And this is the parrot, and we need to learn to shut the parrot up. So what's the parrot? Well, the parrot is, um, we all have a parrot in, in our lives. Um, we're born with a parrot. It sits on our left shoulder, um, and it stays with us all our lives. What do parrots do? Well, parrots learn to speak to us, and they repeat back what we tell them. They just repeat back the words they actually hear. And as a parrot grows, it, it learns to speak. When you were young and you were learning to walk, your parrot was very young and your parrot didn't speak very much because you hadn't taught it very much. So when you were one year old and you tried to stand up on your legs and you fell down on the carpet like most of us did, right? Your parrot was quiet because your parrot hadn't learned to speak. Your parrot didn't say anything to you. Then as you grew up, you went to school, your parrot learns to speak a little bit more and more and more to you, right? And the trouble is, is a parrot only speaks what we tell it, which is often our fears and insecurities, right? So when I go mountain biking with my 22-year-old and he goes down something that resembles a cliff, my parrot goes to me, you're too old for this. You're going to hurt yourself. You're self-employed. You shouldn't be doing this, right? Right? And all my parrot is doing is, is whispering these to me. Now, if I go cycling, uh, mountain biking with one of my friends, who uh, isn't 22, maybe add another 30 years on to that, if not more, and him and I go uh, mountain biking, and we go down something that doesn't resemble a cliff, my parrot will be quiet. I won't hear anything. I'll go down, and everything will be quiet. I won't have any negative thoughts or negative feelings. So it's just certain things that then trigger our parrots to speak to us. And the key thing when this parrot speaks to us, we need to think a little bit about how do we know that to be true? How do I know I'm too old to do that? How do I know, right, I'm going to hurt myself? I don't, right? It's just one of these fears and insecurities that our parrots whisper to us. And the trouble is, is the parrot never leaves us. It stays with us all its life. And what we have to learn is to either shut the parrot up or not listen to it. So what sort of things trigger the sort of self-doubt and, and, and negative feelings that way? Well, there's a pile of things then that can do that, right? So these are some, some, some typical hurdles and challenges that can trigger it. I put there criticism, perceived failure, difficult decisions, maybe feedback from others, the parrot, feeling you have no control, which ties in with the circle of control, unreasonable demands of others. It could be bosses, it could be friends, it could be family, lack of support, poor relationships, lack of clarity, change, right? The last two are very, very sort of apt just now in the world that we're living and what do we do? So all these things can trigger the parrot to actually speak to us and go forward. Right? So when we start thinking about it, what would, you, what would I say there for? What attributes do resilient people have? How do they cope with all this? So the number one thing, I think, is what I call realistic optimism. What do I mean by this? Well, what I mean is, is you plan for the worst, 
you hope for the best and you take whatever comes along. You know, if I was to ask you the question, I'm picking on ScotRail today, but I could pick on any travel company. You know, does ScotRail travel, do ScotRail run trains? Yes. Are some trains late? Yes. Right? Um, but when people get really upset when the odd train becomes late, I'm going to myself, why is this, this a surprise to you? It happens. I'm always amazed if you ever listen to um, a radio station first thing in the morning, um, normally, when people are traveling to work. I always think that the traffic announcement, right, from the traffic um, um, correspondents, I'm always amazed how they can make it sound like a, a surprise that the M8 at Junction 4 is, is snarled up at Whitburn and Livingston, that actually the, the M8 going through Glasgow has got um, congestion and queues on it. Because actually, does that not happen every Monday to Friday morning? You know, they make it a surprise that the school run and there's traffic there. So let's be realistic about it. You, you know, you're, if you're going to travel the M8, you're going to hit traffic. Realistic optimism. Plan for the worst. Hope for the best. Take whatever comes along. Second thing. Talk about they can rationalise and turn negative experience into learning. In other words, they can take the emotion out of situations. Right? Right? The, the, you know, the past is the past. If it's happened, can you turn it back? No, we can't melt, turn back time. Well, most of us can't anyway. So we can't turn back time. How do you do that? Well, the only thing you can do is take the emotion out of it, rationalise it, and turn it into, into a learning type of in, in experience, rather than keep worrying about it. Third thing, they ignore rejection. Right? You send somebody an email, they don't reply. You leave somebody a voicemail and they don't come back to you. You walk into a networking meeting, you walk up to two people, somebody walks off. Is it about you or is it about them? I would say the vast majority of the time, over 90% of the time, when people ignore you, when they don't return phone calls, when they don't return emails, right? It's about what's going on in their lives rather than what's going on in yours. In other words, it's not because you're a bad person. They're just ignoring you because they're too busy focused on other things or other things that's actually going on. If you think about it yourself, when you don't return phone calls or emails, it's to do with what you've got going on as well in your lives. They celebrate all successes. They find, they find good news in every single day, right? Even if it's a simple thing like the train was in time, the coffee was good that they bought at the, um, on the way in, right? Or actually somebody made a, gave them a phone call or somebody gave you some good news or whatever it is. They celebrate all their successes that way. They build a strong network. And, and I think this is really important at this time that we're going through this now. Right, is to keep in contact with people. You know, you know, do you, are you doing WhatsApp video conference, not video conference, uh, video calls with your friends? Right, are you speaking with your two meter um, social distancing over over the fence to your neighbour? Right, um, or across the landing if you're in a flat? Are you keeping in contact? Are you speaking to people? And you know, there's different ways to be able to continue to self isolate but still have a conversation and still be in contact with people and take things forward. This is a great opportunity, a time for learning for growth opportunities, right? Um, up to 10 days ago, I had never used Zoom. I don't know how many of you had used Zoom, I probably even heard of Zoom up to about 10 days, two weeks ago. Growth opportunities is about learning something new, going out, trying stuff, doing stuff. One of the most resilient people I ever met, right, at the age of 65, signed up to go and learn German at night school. She did that for three years uh, until she was 68. And then for the next 12 years of her life, she traveled every single year on holiday to Switzerland, to the German speaking part of Switzerland on holiday on her own. She just kept learning stuff and doing stuff and she kept doing it all the way into her 80s that way. Learn stuff, right? Embrace it, give it a go. What's the worst that can happen? And then the final one is to appreciate what they have. I think in this time, it's a very important thing to appreciate what you do have rather than what you don't have. A lot of our worlds are all turned upside down. 
But even outside of this time, there's an expression that says, there's always a bigger boat. What does that mean? Well, if you're a multimillionaire and you live in Monte Carlo and you've got the biggest yacht in the world and it's sitting down the harbour and you look at your penthouse window down on your big boat in the harbour, the bad news for you is there's probably some Russian megalomaniac somewhere, right, that's got um, even more money and got an even bigger boat in order. In other words, there's always go you're always going to meet people who, in your views, might have more successful careers, the kids are doing more things, they're going on a fancier holiday or whatever. There is always going to be something that way. So always one of the things that resilient people do is they appreciate what they have and take it forward. So one of the things about, well, that, that's quite common sense in the sense of, well, these are the things that trigger me, Mark, and these are the things that you know, resilient people do. Right? But how, how do you get that bit in between? The key thing round about this is awareness. We need to become aware that actually we're being triggered and things are going on. So how do you, what do you notice about yourself when you start doubting or worrying? Right? You know, what happens to your breathing maybe? What emotions do you have? What thoughts fly through your mind? What behaviours do you demonstrate that way? Now there's a pile of different behaviours that can become. Some of us can start eating, some can stop eating. Some of us um, go quiet, some of us start talking more. Some of us maybe get sweaty hat palms, some of us tend to maybe um, play with our nails or whatever. I personally start playing with my wedding ring and I start billing it round on my finger and, and doing stuff when I start to get um, some doubt and worry about things. So I'm going to ask for the last poll today and um, it's definitely anonymous, so don't worry about sharing it. I'm just going to ask to see what, if, if any of you know what you happens about yourself when you do that. So I'm going to come off and stop sharing this. And Rebecca, if we could, um, in a minute, when you got it there, could you launch the final poll, please? There we go. Has it come up for everyone? Yes, I can see it. Thank you. Perfect. There we go, I'm going to share it now. Have you got the results there, Mark? I haven't got any results. Let me, just, let uh, me shut that and try, try that again. I'll try and share the results again. There we go. Yep, Perfect. that's great. Oh. Yeah, um, so very good, very common one, people going quiet. Yes, that's often often the case. Um, the eating one tends to be either people stop or start eating. I personally always start reading the chocolate biscuit barrel um, that way. Yeah. Oh, no sweaty palms or hands, oh, that's unusual. Yeah, the second queasy one, yeah. The nails is quite common as well. Um, and obviously some, some of you, um, the, the list wasn't um, complete enough for you, but there, there can be a multitude of different ones there and taking it forward. That's great. Thank you. We'll go back to. The key thing round about this is actually to get aware when you're being triggered, because once we know we're being triggered, right, we can do something about it. We can choose to shut the parrot up. We can choose to think a little bit about these seven attributes that resilient people do and to try and manage it. But the, ca the catch is often knowing that you're being triggered. It's something that's worthwhile actually asking some family or friends around about, people that know you well, because they'll tell you what you're like when you're being triggered. And if you don't want to do that, one other thing you can do, right, is, is to answer almost this question here, right? Is, how are you feeling today? Um, and just like literally score yourself like one out of five, 
one being actually I need a Red Bull, I need a, a Greg's bacon roll, and I'm feeling absolutely no energy at all, right? Or, you know, five, top of the world, going to conquer it, don't give me any more caffeine and I'm going to go hyper. So, you know, there's a variety of scales in there. And, you know, how could you do that? Well, a lot of you will have a Samsung or an Apple phone. They come with a hell hat. And it's, you know, the Samsung ones, just literally one to five stars. How are you feeling today? If you, the people that do that um, generally find that you do it best, either do it first thing in the morning before you leave the flat of the house to go to work. Um, because if you think about it, a lot of us will look at our physical appearance before we go to work or before we come on a video call, right? Do we look at our internal appearance? Do we look about how we're feeling? Do we do some self-reflection in there about how am I feeling? And if you're feeling maybe only down at a one or two, even a three, maybe don't look at the BBC news. Maybe just avoid these people that you know are going to drain you of energy. These people that will not help you through the day. And go and find these people that cheer you up, the ones that make you feel like life's worth living, because that's the sort of thing you should do. Or the other time of day to do it is about five o'clock at night when you finish work and about going into the evening. What I would suggest is don't do it last thing at night because by that stage there's very little you can do about it and all you do is go away thinking about it. So last couple of things just to uh, finish off. Um, some of you might have come across this before. Vulnerability factors, four things that actually um, cause us to um, feel more vulnerable to self-doubt and worry and, and impacts our personal resilience. Um, the H is the one that often surprises people. people the H stands for being hungry. Low blood sugar, right, triggers self-doubt and worry. So those of you that actually, when you start to worry, stop eating, it actually makes the situation worse. If you don't believe me, think a little bit about when our children, when they're about five years old, the most cantankerous, it's normally an hour before dinner, right? When our teenagers the worst, when they come home from school, normally hungry between four and six. And if you just think it applies to teenagers, think a little bit about yourself. If you go shopping um, on the way home from work and you buy some food, then go home, have your tea, versus if, if you go home, have your tea and go shopping at eight o'clock at night, I would suggest what you buy is different based on your low blood sugar. The A stands for if you're angry or annoyed about something else. So if you're already been triggered or annoyed about something else, then you're much more likely to be vulnerable to the next thing that comes along. The L stands for lonely. If we feel isolated, a classic example in these current environments, hence why I'm encouraging people to make contact with people, whether it's virtual, through phone or, or video or whatever, or even if it is just literally, you know, safe distance over the garden fence or whatever, uh, keep speaking to people, right? Right. When you go out a walk, don't ignore people just now are putting their heads down and not wanting to give eye contact. Give eye contact, right? Looking at people does not pass any virus on, right? And the final one, T is tired. If we're tired, we often, um, well, again, more likely to be vulnerable to self-doubt and worry. So these are just four things to, to remember and to do. So the last thing I would say before we go to the questions is how to become good at being you and build your personal resilience. Well, I think this is a very powerful statement. Resilience starts with self-acceptance, right? Your level of resilience, in fact, can never be greater than your level of self-acceptance because believing that you're good enough it's what gives you the courage to be authentic, vulnerable, and imperfect. And I think just, you know, does this mean you shouldn't try and prove yourself and learn new things? No, it doesn't mean that. It just means is don't give yourself a hard time. You are your what you are the biggest critic of yourself in the world, right? Give yourself a bit of a break, right? And this might come as a bit of a shock to one or two of you, but the perfect human being's not yet been born, right? So don't don't put yourself out there as far as being, you know, having to be perfect. So as I say, resilience starts with self-acceptance. Accept who you are, right? Accept that you're authentic, you're vulnerable and imperfect. And then thereafter, we stop giving ourselves a hard time. And that's me. So I'll hand back to um, Rebecca and Roxy and um, we can see if there's any questions or any people would like to ask or anything they'd like to share themselves.